Okay. It's always a great sign when a movie begins with uh, tax treaties. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. My name is George, and with me is Chris, and today we are looking at The Phantom Menace, episode one. <laughs> the... <laughs> what I would describe, <laughs> and I think many people have described around this time, uh, this movie as the way that my parents call me, which is the great disappointment. <laughs> When this movie came out, I wasn't living in, uh, in in the Western Hemisphere yet. But even since then, like years after when I when my family moved here, I've heard tales of uh, how much of a crashing disappointment this was when uh, when it first came out. Look, I was uh, I was a young boy. Yeah, <laughs> in uh, That's good. in my little <laughs> <laughs> in my little rural. Uh, unincorporated uh, community. Star Wars Episode One was like one of the first times that I was kind of like a part of pop culture while it was happening, I guess. Mm -hmm. I found while I was watching it this time that I actually can't remember how I personally felt about the movie when I watched it in theater because <laughs> there was such a, an overwhelming, resounding negative reaction to the movie like from mm -hmm. the world. And so my first experience of being kind of like part of a cultural conversation or like knowing what people were talking about was being um, like in the midst of a, of a maelstrom of fan hatred <laughs> for this movie. I can see how this movie would be enjoyable if you're a child because it has that cartoonish feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I can see where the anger comes from, from the fans, which at this point would have been like in the 30s and 40s remembering the original Star Wars. Yes, you know, and then as an adult going to watch this, um, it would have been, I feel like, fairly disappointing that it, that it didn't age with you. Be mindful of the living force, young Padawan. Yes, Master. If I have not already tipped my hand, I'm I'm outing myself now as a pro Phantom Menace voice. <laughs> uh, but there are things I love about this movie and enough things that I love about this movie to overwhelm the things mm. that I dislike about this movie. But I'll happily admit many things that are confusing about it and bad about it. And one of them, I'm totally with you. They they introduced the Jedi by fighting the stupid little battle droids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this makes them less cool. Yeah. like I feel them, like I could fight so a battle dumb. droid. <laughs> exactly. Roger Roger droids are so yeah. stupid looking. I know everyone complains about this part, but I love him erotically working the lightsaber handle here. <laughs> <laughs> so last week we had Thora Birch's terrible princess performance. Yeah, and this week yeah. we have an actor who we know from other films is an excellent actor. And we know as a child actor was an excellent actor. Mm -hmm. how, how did you feel about Amidala? <laughs> Look, one of her earliest movies that I've seen is Leon the Professional. That scene where she's standing at the doorway begging for the door to please be open so she doesn't get killed is some of the best acting I've ever it's, seen. I can see it now. I haven't seen that movie for years. And it's still, so like, intense. It still pulls at my heart right now. <laughs> and, and, and Lucas had her do just the opposite. And just so bland and so, like, dull. I don't know why there's this confusion that stoicism means no emotion. I'm glad you said stoicism because what I really reacted to, and I don't know if it was just after watching Thora Birch last time, but mm. this time, what I really felt, this is a this 14 year old girl, uh, who, you know, who's going to wind up like completely outclassed and manipulated by this by this mastermind evil guy who who's in this position of incredible power and trying to do best by her people and essentially like playing grown up whether or not it like comes off as like kind of a bad stilted awkward performance i think this girl this character this person who has to get on all this finery and and act and represent naboo um as as a sovereign ruler um that she would have this kind of stilted awkward performance that she's putting on i don't know if that's the obviously george lucas directs people to <laughs> terrible performances so that would be another justification for how this works yeah. but i did see an alignment there between the way the performance feels stilted as a movie performance and the way that i think maybe would be accurate for a character like this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah like I, I i guess so i i can see that reasoning i think the other part is 
the just the dialogue given to her. I don't think anybody can make it work, really. I cannot condone a course of action that will lead <laughs> us into war. Yeah, there's no... I don't think there's a way to make it good. But the other part is the direction given to her for her physicality. Mm -hmm. This whole scene, she's so stiff that all it makes me think of is her costumes will fall apart if she moves her head. It's like <laughs> a, uh, the Batman Begins thing where... She, you know, Christian Bale can't turn his head because of the costume. <laughs> they like sit, they sit Portman down in the chair and then just like build the costume onto her. Yeah, yeah. that's what it feels like. And it just, it feels so uncomfortable, unnatural. And then given those lines, it just, it, it seems like a bit of a waste of talent. Yeah, I totally agree. All I'll say again is just, um, she's a, she's an unfit ruler who's out of her depth and, and everything that you're saying there does fit with that characterization. Hmm. Yeah, okay. She's uncomfortable, she doesn't wear her clothes well, she's stiff, she's, yeah. The, the most hated, <laughs> one of the most hated characters. The way he talks, it's irritating, but I think the reason he's so attention-grabbing is that the, his character, as well as the entire pod raising scene, is clearly... And I don't think it's a surprise, right? Everybody knows this already. It's Lucas trying to show off the technology, trying to show off his studio. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a demo reel. Well, I agree. It's like, it's like tempting to think of it as showing off. I I do also think I think this movie is nothing if not ambitious, and I think the fact that he went whole hog on such a potentially divisive and potentially disastrous and actually disastrous choice um, <laughs> is kind of neat, personally. It's it I, makes the movie way worse, but yes. I I like that he went for it. I just didn't have it in me to be bothered to be too much bothered by Jar Jar anymore. I don't know if it's because I spent so many years <laughs> hating Jar Jar and making jokes at his expense. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's um just that the movie feels old now and it, so it doesn't feel it's just kind of a curiosity. Honestly, the way that this character is terrible is just like a feeling that I regularly get from big budget movies now the fact that he's unnecessary the shoddy cg that's way overused and just in your face unabashedly um these are all experiences that um i won't name names i guess it do doesn't really matter <laughs> but like that i i really have with some like big budget movies now yeah. i i get the same experience of just like this is just unnecessary and it's millions of dollars going down the drain and you clearly think I'm an idiot if you think that this is yeah. what I want to be in the film. Even for kids. Like, I can see that his train of thought thinking like, oh, you know, we're talking about politics and stuff, which he shouldn't have done it to begin with. But like, you know, there's politics and all that stuff going on. And for the kids that are watching, we're going to need something funny for them to laugh at. And you know what? I'm glad Pixar has proved him wrong. Mm. That you can make a movie for kids and still have it be about, you know, subjects that, you think kids wouldn't understand, but they totally do. Right. It can have heart. It can have weight to to everything that's happening. Huh? <laughs> Imagine if the movie began here. At the okay. moisture farms. <laughs> <laughs> well, the three characters <laughs> arriving. I mean, yeah, it is mirroring. Uh, yeah. the, you know, episode four, but why not? You're, you're bringing the fans back 30 years later. Let them remember, right? So it's, it's a tossing your fan a coin. But also, like, if you begin here and you introduce um, Anakin right away and then Qui-Gon goes on all the, the, the missions that he does with, uh, with Obi-Wan, you can potentially use that as a um, showcasing a young Anakin violence very early on mm. and giving him multiple layers of like traumatic events right to really build up why he's such a you know a toss of a coin uh later on in life whether going bad or good mm -hmm. right because he's seen both great kindness and great cruelty early on but i think he's the toss of a coin because we're all the toss of a coin i think that's what's exciting about it we're all just like the loss yeah. of our family and the loss of the right guidance away from from becoming yeah, but it, it, and then it also it also gives him more time with two potential masters. I don't. Yeah, and I don't disagree with with your script note. Start from here, and then what you can do is also you can show more, uh, of the mistreatment of him and his mother, 
Yeah. Right? Because now you have more time to show that thing. And then it builds, it gives it more weight to why he's so unwilling to leave. We've already had four, five, six, which is the perspective of the hero on the, on the hero's journey. The young farm boy who dreams of blah, 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 and ends up blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What if the, the entire idea here, what if, what Lucas is signposting for us here is that we're now shifting to like an adult perspective to to the perspective of the mentor to watching to watching this character from the outside rather than being on the journey with him and mm -hmm. uh, and coming into our power and going on a great quest and meeting the princess and turning out to be snogging your sister and whatever else the classic hero's <laughs> journey um, what if he, what if Lucas instead is saying here here is the repetition of that story but from the perspective of the teacher. What if this is actually the older and wiser series for all its stupidity and its poop jokes and, and its Jar Jar? Um, what if this actually does answer your concern that, that the fans had grown up? Because it asks us to look at this from the perspective of the Jedi, the mentors, rather than the person going through it. I mean, I think that's a totally reasonable... Uh, thing to have to want i just don't think george lucas is good enough to do it to pull it off fair enough yeah <laughs> i think that's the issue i think is that given another director they probably could have done it i just don't think he's good enough oh and that reminds me if you like this video and you want to hear the entire uncut 90 minute long podcast version uh go check out our patreon links down below in the description anyways i can't believe there's still slavery in the galaxy the republic's anti-slavery laws are the republic doesn't exist out here we must survive on our own. Okay. So I remember first time watching this, I hated him more than anything else in this scene. Just the f***ing apple eating. You would do it if you could. Okay, look, I would do it, but I wouldn't do it while people were talking about slavery. Fair. <laughs> good, good criticism. Why the f*** would you inject humor when you're trying to make an emotional scene about a mother and, his, and her child being enslaved? <laughs> The tongue grabbing apple going, excuse me, is about as bad as just having him ripping a fart. Oh, I just don't have the energy, but can someone please edit this jar jar into all the famous slavery movies? <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me personally, Every moment from th from the first frame of the pod race sequence to the mm -hmm. last frame is is just pure cinematic bliss. I know it looks like shit. <laughs> I I yeah. recognize that, but for me this this is like one of the perfect blockbuster movie sequences of all time, and one of the best things that Star Wars yeah. has ever done. As an action sequence, it is really fun. It is really exciting, but I think it's because I'm of the camp that a movie should never have a scene just for the sake of it being mm -hmm. cool and serve no purpose of the plot. Mm -hmm. To me, I feel like everything should always serve the progression of the plot first. Mm -hmm. And then if you can make it cool, that's great. That's the cherry on top. I guess what I would say is that the centerpiece sequence here of the first film is the crucible for the character of Anakin, who has never won a race before, has never finished a race before, um, and who now finds, uh, whether or not he knows it, that his his entire existence, and indeed, as we know, the entire fate of the universe, rests on his performance in, in this one race. Mm -hmm. So, on the one hand, yeah, I, I think I can agree with you, like, the script didn't do a great job of setting it up. But on the other hand, I... Um, I think it's a test of I I think it's perfectly reasonable to read the pod race as a test of Anakin's connection to the force. Um we get that lovely moment near the end when he reconnects the cable and uh and we can't help but think maybe there's a little bit of uh a little mm -hmm. bit of force help going on in there. And um and and I I just I I mean maybe it's just cuz I'm so excited about the sequence <laughs> but but I do I I felt the stakes. I, I think uh, I think it might a lot of it comes down to our two different preferences sometimes. I think, like yeah, I, I it really irks me when movies have excessive fat that can right. be trimmed. Yeah, whereas I just see the fat as the point in this case. The last thing I'll say about the Padre sequence is, um, to for me, most blockbuster sequences and the, and the ability of most blockbuster directors just pales in comparison to this sequence. I I find it to be like meticulously staged 
cinematic action. You know exactly what's going on and exactly the location of every single person at every single time. You understand the geography. You understand the progression uh, of the stakes and of the race and how far Anakin is behind at each point and what the dangers are. You learn the course over the three laps and start to anticipate and, and experience alongside the racers what's coming next. Um, and then the the cutting, the, just the composition of the shots and the cutting, I find so incredibly exciting that it's not, there's nothing shaky. There are no, there are no big, um, you know, like fancy shots or, or where the camera swoops down or, or, or where CG allows us to, there are full CG shots, but they don't, they don't break the cinematic mold of the way the rest of the thing is, is composed. Mm -hmm. It just, to me, it's like, it's just like a classically perfect sequence and I, and I just don't I, I don't think film directors can often put something together like this anymore yeah yeah um and and that may just be me being old-fashioned and film directors just don't want to put something together like this anymore and fair enough uh, but I yeah. I find this I find this as exciting now as as I did 20 whatever yeah. years ago yeah I love that's it. fair and you can drop <laughs> Now, I just want to point out, Darth Maul has no idea who this kid is. No. He's just so ready to mow him out down. Oh, yeah. Darth Maul kills any kid he sees. <laughs> he just a, no just as a matter of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the council. Um, I mean, it's great to, to see Yoda and Samuel, but I just wish it was under more fun circumstances. <laughs> Yeah, the it's Jedi Council are just like these lazy bastards. Yeah. He's like it's like I found the Messiah. They're like well, I guess we'll take a look if you really <laughs> I love this. I just think it's, it's so funny that everyone's oh. floating stages have to keep moving around the whole time they're talking. It's like it's so visually cool, <laughs> wasted on something so fucking dull. <laughs> It, but it's a representation of the whole movie. You get, like, great actors to do terribly dull things. Ouch time. This was made at the exact same time as <laughs> Lord of the Rings. And both have, like, a big army battle sequence with a bit of CG. I mean, the other one is a half CG, half real people. Yeah. With a significantly smaller budget. And this yeah. looks so much worse than yeah. the, than the line I, of elves. I think I will go to my grave not knowing how Lord of the Rings looks better than every other movie ever made. I <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what happened there. Well, okay, so I just the the first appearance of Darth Maul when the doors open is is like an all time yeah movie moment. There is nothing. This is the way I'll put it. There is nothing in seven eight nine that approaches the the pure level of of operatic excitement that that the yeah. moment when those doors open and reveal Darth Maul does for me. I I think the only moment that I can think of in the newer Star Wars movies that matches this entrance sequence is uh Rogue One. Right. With the Vader in the hallway. But like this I, I think the music helped a lot. <laughs> it it sure carried did. a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. To, to making how awesome Darth Maul is. Yeah, but it, it, I just wish they didn't keep cutting back to this f***ing kid. Also, did I misunderstand this sequence? Or does does Anakin eventually, like, destroy the... He, he like, shoots the main reactor from a random cargo bay? Is that what happens? Because <laughs> he, like, shoots something, something explodes, and then it cuts to the guys, and they're like, there's a problem with the main reactor. <laughs> and then the entire ship explodes, but he's just like in a, he's just like in a ship bay. Yeah, I think the theory behind that is that Matt Nicholson's character actually built a flaw in every, <laughs> 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 or every uh, every system across the galaxy. <laughs> this is why you don't go with the lowest bidding engineering company. It turns out, Galen Erso is the the biggest mass murderer in the Star Wars universe <laughs> <laughs> through faulty engineering. <laughs> I think this sequence is incredibly ambitious in that I think, like I said earlier, like there's a, there's something like five threads that turn into yeah. four threads. Um, but we're following 
an incredible number of characters through very different sequences all intercut. I think it's very impressive that we know what's going on in each of the sequences and are able to keep track of it. However, yeah. um, I don't think it's like successful. Uh, I think it ends up like kind of watering down the impact of the most enjoyable parts of the story. I think you can engage if the three or five things that are ongoing have similar tones. Right. <laughs> And momentums. It doesn't work if you go back and forth between anxiety, silly, goofy comedy, yeah, and girl boss. Yeah, right. It's too jarring. It's way too different. I you're, love you're, that girl boss is a tone. <laughs> hey, I'm broken. <laughs> I love Palpatine here. He's so goddamn happy. <laughs> I I love the whole like last third of the movie. He just can't believe everything has worked out so awesomely. <laughs> like he fools the queen and then she's like, you know what? I think I have to go back to Naboo. And he's like, really? <laughs> and he's just, just walking around grinning in his pantaloons fantastic so okay and then that's it it just ends it just ends and it the, and it kind of the... feels like that only i think because like there's not a satisfying quest that has ended exactly it also doesn't feel like it's leading anything like it's it's pretty conclusive here mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like it, it there's no sam and frodo going on a boat off river and then you know the yeah. the fellowship breaking up yeah, and then it just goes like, and then it just assumes that you will watch the next one. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> to to everybody's chagrin. <laughs> How can it get worse? And it so does. We're done this week, and we uh, will come back next week with the second of the prequels, uh, Attack of the Clones. Yeah. Yep. That's that's about as much excitement as it uh, Attack as it deserves. Thanks for being here. Remember to like and subscribe and uh, join us next week.